Alright, today is Thursday, July 14th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And it's going to be short and squeeze, excuse me, short and sweet. It might be a short squeeze in the market, but I'm talking about short and sweet conversation we're about to have in this program tonight. And by short and sweet, of course, I mean uh, 40 minutes or so. But anyhow, it's an interesting conversation because there is an alarming trend happening in corporate America's earnings as of late. Let's not waste any more time, and here it is, in focus tonight. An alarming trend happening in corporate earnings. Before we talk about that, we have two problems in the economy, two dynamics colliding at the same time. Number one, inflation. Number two, recession. Now, how could the two exist at the same time? Well, there's something called expectations. We now have an inflation that doesn't appear to be cooling down anytime soon, even though we have a lot of talk about peak inflation, and we might indeed have peak inflation in certain commodities, but all in all, the inflation rate and the inflation trend for now remains extremely alarming. For example, today we got the PPI, which is the producer price index. Some would argue that the PPI is a leading indicator to the CPI, the consumer price index, because what the producers are going to pay right now, that will be passed down to you and I, the consumer, in the next few months. Well, today the PPI went higher and read 11.3% inflation year over year. Most alarmingly, it went higher month over month. So a lot of folks said, hey, look at this. Perhaps March was the peak because the subsequent two readings came down month over month. But now we have that same reading popping higher again. Now, what about the other alarming force hitting the economy right now? Recession. We talked in this program numerous times that we're seeing a recessionary theme, specifically in the poor, the lower middle class, and that recessionary force is moving its way higher in the income bracket. It is hitting the middle class, soon enough the high middle class, and then the rich, and then the 1%, the oligarchs. But of course, when that happens, we have to bail out the oligarchs. Recession fears are hitting the economy, and the best indicator is the yield curve, which has always, always been a spot-on indicator, a spot-on predictor of recessions. Right now, we're seeing one of the most steep and aggressive yield curve we have seen in at least two decades. Now, as you can see, I showed you this chart yesterday. The inversion in the yield curve is telling us that a recession is around the corner. Perhaps in the fourth quarter, or at the most, in 2023. Now, could it be different this time around? You can play that game all you want, but every time they said, oh, the yield curve is inverting for a different reason, and it is different this time around. You cannot really rely on historical trends. These people were proven wrong over and over and over again. This is a spot-on indicator that we're going to have a recession. So we have to trust and take seriously these kind of indicators. But how could the two exist at the same time? How could inflation fears exist at the same time with recession fears? Because one would argue inflation is rising higher because we're seeing wage inflation, we're seeing an economy expanding rapidly at a pace that it cannot sustain, and therefore you have inflation. How could that exist with recession fears? The answer is, in the evolution of inflation, it started out as good for the economy, the honeymoon phase. Everybody's getting higher wages, the unemployed is finding jobs, corporate expenditure is expanding, expanding, money all over the place, assets valuations move higher, but then comes the ugly part of inflation. The ugly part of inflation is when the consumer's wage inflation and income cannot keep pace with the inflation around them, and the consumer starts cutting around spending in certain corners of the economy to compensate for others. If they're spending more at the gas pump, on rent, on utilities, at the grocery store, they're going to have to cut down spending in other categories. And therefore, we hit stagflation in the economy. Stagflation happens when inflation persists at a higher level, while the pace of economic activity slows down. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the majority of corners of this economy. Now, stagflation is a dangerous phenomenon for any economy, because when inflation sticks, while we see job losses in the economy, while we see businesses shutting down because of the consumer is not spending anymore in these businesses, you have a slow, painful death of the economy. To prevent all of that, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the world, has to interfere. And they interfere by increasing interest rates higher. When they do that, inflation goes away. But it goes away at the expense of a recession, a crash in the stock market, in the real estate market, in the economy. And then the repair work and the recovery starts. And that could be a long time, 
a short time, depending on how surgical and precise the Fed is in tackling inflation. Now, we know that the Fed is way behind the curve. They should have raised interest rates last year, and we would have avoided this conversation altogether. But now we're here. We cannot cry over spilled milk. We can demand that the bastards of the Fed to be fired and removed from their jobs because they're incompetent. But in the meantime, if the Fed starts tightening the monetary policy right now, there will be a lot of damage, but this damage will be amplified the longer the Fed waits to increase interest rates high enough to kill this inflation. Meaning, the longer they wait, the more shy they are, the more hesitant they are to increase interest rates aggressively, the more damage the economy has to endure when the Fed finally realizes that yes, we're seeing job losses in the economy, yes, we're seeing business slowing down dramatically, we're seeing recessionary forces all over the economy, but inflation is ticking. And to kill that inflation, they're going to increase interest rates dramatically at some point, and that will hurt a very wounded economy, and that produces a prolonged recession recession and a long journey to recovery. So with that understanding, we know that this stagflation will transition into a recession and therefore we have the coexistence. In the meantime, we have inflation, yet we have recession fears because we have certain dynamics in the economy that tend to look forward. Among them, the stock market and the commodities market, and therefore we're seeing these two crashing right now. Matter of fact, the IMF says avoiding a recession is increasingly challenging, and it cut the U.S. growth forecast once again. And here's the transition for you, the evidence, if you understood what I just said. The headline reads, Inflation, coffee visits to Starbucks, Dunkin' drop as record high inflation takes hold. You see, the consumer is paying more at the gas pump, in rent, in utility bills, at the grocery store, so they have to cut spending otherwise in items, services, goods that they deem inessential, they can live without. One of these things is foregoing buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks that costs you an arm and a leg. What is it, five, six bucks a cup for a coffee that tastes like ass? Well, you can live without that, you can make your own coffee at home. It's inconvenient, maybe, but you cannot afford to keep spending at Starbucks 5 to $6 every single day because you're getting squeezed at the gas pump, the grocery store, etc., etc. What does that do to the economy when the consumer stops spending at Starbucks? We see a recessionary force in these kind of businesses. We're already seeing it in certain retail businesses such as Target. We got earnings from Walmart suggesting the same. Now we're seeing it in Starbucks and it goes on and on and on. Slowly but surely, stagflation starts to kill the economy little by little by little by introducing recessionary forces little by by little by little. And of course, the recession finally happens when the Fed finally wakes up and decides to tackle inflation. And we are finally seeing the Fed zombies, the officials who've been saying transitory, transitory, transitory about inflation, finally waking up. But are they waking up enough? For example, you have uh, Janet Yellen, transitory Yellen, who should have been fired from her job a few months ago. Well, she comes out and says that inflation in the US is unacceptably high and it should be Washington's top priority. We know that Washington can do nothing about inflation. They can cut spending. They can introduce austerity measures. But we know from history that that doesn't work. The only entity that has the power and the tools to tackle inflation is the Federal Reserve. The problem is they have blunt force tools, mainly raising interest rates. And when they introduce that, it doesn't only kill inflation, but it also kills the economy. Now, we're all familiar that the Federal Reserve is not here to serve the American public. The Federal Reserve is here to serve the oligarchs, the 1%, by propping up the assets of the wealthy, stocks, real estate. And now that we're seeing stocks moving down, we're seeing fears after a much hotter than expected jobs report last Friday, and this week, a much hotter than expected CPI report, and now a hotter than expected PPI report, the expectations in the market for the Fed to be aggressive in raising interest rates went significantly higher. The talk for now is perhaps the Fed needs to increase interest rates by 100 basis points, if not more, in the next meeting. The consensus for now is 75 basis points. But yesterday, after we got the CPI report, the stock market went down, mainly because market expectations changed and adjusted that 75 basis points hike to a 100 basis point hike. But we saw dip buying yesterday. Today, once again, the market gapped down in the morning, yet we saw yet another round of dip buying. Why? Because Fed members are now afraid of upsetting the stock market too much. Now they're saying, oh, did, did we say 100 basis points? Um, never mind. We'll stick to 75 basis points for now. Among those backtrackers is one of the most recently hawkish 
Fed members, Governor Waller, well, he came out today and said, yeah, 100 basis points, that's, um, we're not doing that. That's not the base case. We're going to stick to 75 basis points. And immediately, we saw the two-year yield falling down aggressively and equities catching a bit. Likewise, another one, San Luis Fed President Bullard, who tends to be in the hawkish side, he's now also saying, we'll just do 75, forget about 100 basis points. They can say that all they want right now to prop up the stock market, of course. The danger is... If they don't act aggressively, inflation expectations will get out of control again. And who knows what's going to happen with oil prices. Maybe they're going to catch a bid. Perhaps not all the way to the highs. Maybe we have the top in oil. But the key word is sticky. If oil prices stick at around 90, 100, that will be bad. That will damage the economy tremendously. So the Fed can play this game and say, hey, we're just going to stick to 75 basis points. But when push comes to shove, either, number one, they will be forced to do 100 basis points plus, or they're going to be callous about the state of inflation, inflation expectations of the economy, and stick to 75, and maybe talk about, in the next meeting, a 25 basis points. Maybe they're going to start cutting rates to prop up the stock market. What they're going to do is they're going to watch the economy being damaged by stagflation little by little by little by little, while inflation itself sticks around. And at that point, when they finally submit and they realize that they have to be aggressive with the interest rate policy, they will raise it with a very wounded economy, which will prolong the recession. And unfortunately for the Fed, we're already seeing those recessionary forces working their way in corporate America aggressively and rapidly. Key word, rapidly, meaning the Fed is running at a time. The Fed needs to do the shock and awe, interest rate hikes. Otherwise, by the fourth quarter of this year, we will see a lot of recessionary forces across corporate America and across the economy, while inflation is going to stick above 2%. It's not going to go down there on its own. Take, for example, the earnings report that we got today from JP Morgan. JP Morgan is becoming more conservative because they know and they see the recessionary forces across the economy, specifically in small businesses, and that works its way up all the way to larger businesses. Today, J.P. Morgan announced that they're suspending buybacks, and gangster Jamie Dimon issued a warning for the global economy because profits are moving down for corporations. That is an alarming trend, and you're going to see it for yourself in a minute. Let's visit three companies that reported earnings this week. Number one, PepsiCo. Here's the income sheet for PepsiCo. Sales year over year, the revenue went higher by 5.24%. So far, so good, right? Here's the problem. The cost of sales went higher by 6% year over year. What does that mean? PepsiCo is losing to inflation. They need to increase prices even higher so the pace of growth in the revenue year over year surpasses the growth rate in the cost of goods that they're buying year over year. The problem is, can PepsiCo raise prices right now or is the consumer too damaged and they cannot even afford to do that? All that thought. We're going to revisit it again. But before we do that, expenses for PepsiCo went higher by almost 2.5% year over year, while the operating profits went down significantly. And the operating margin right now is at around 10.26. What does that mean? For each dollar that the company makes in revenue, they keep about 10.26 cents. That is not a good operating margin. And of course, the net income for the company went down year over year by a stunning 39.39%. So what's going on here? You have sales increasing year over year, but the net income, the profit for the company is down by over 39%. What's going on here? That tells us that the company is struggling with this inflation. Yes, they're increasing prices higher, and that is boosting the revenues year over year. The problem is either they're not raising prices enough, or they cannot raise prices high enough because of consumer backlash or consumer demand will go down. They just cannot afford it. And hence, their expenses are moving at a faster rate than the the revenue. What you see right here explains why profits are down. Now, you can say, but Maverick, look at the impairment for intangible assets. That cost PepsiCo a massive drop in net income. This is, of course, the charge when PepsiCo sold its Tropicana and juice business. Okay, you got a point here. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, or maybe not. If you recall, last week I made a video comparing earnings from General Mills with J.M. Smucker. Both companies have the same problem. Their revenues are moving higher year over year because they're increasing prices significantly higher on consumers who can still afford the product. The problem is their expenses are moving at a rapid rate that their profits, the net income, is struggling to keep up. In certain companies, it did not not go negative yet, but as you can see in PepsiCo, it went negative. And this is an alarming trend. It shows us that companies 
are struggling to keep up with this inflation. So what is the next step before we talk about that? Let me give you another clearer example of what I'm talking about. Today, we got earnings from another consumer brand, Conegra, and the headline reads, Packaged food giant Conegra expects shoppers to grow increasingly worry about higher grocery bills. What are they talking about? Here it is. While net sales for the company went higher year over year by 3.1%, costs and expenses went higher by a stunning 8.6% year over year. So you have net sales moving higher by 3.1% year over year, but your expenses are moving higher by 8.6% year over year. And hence, it is no surprise here that the net income for the company profits went down year over year by a stunning almost 32 percent here we have another company that cannot increase prices high enough to keep with this inflation for one or two reasons either they have bad management and they're not increasing prices high enough or they cannot increase prices high enough because they will receive a backlash from the consumer whether that backlash is voluntary or forced either the consumer says i'm not paying for higher prices or the consumer says I cannot afford it. So again, what is the solution? I want you to think about that as I'm speaking right now to you. Put yourself in the shoes of the CEO of one of these companies, PepsiCo or Conegra. What do you do now? Your profits are getting crushed year over year. What do you do? How do you solve this problem? While you think about that, I'm going to present you with another example that we got this week, this time around from Delta Airlines. Maybe this is a little hard to see. Maybe you want to pause and put it on full screen so you can see it. But the operating revenue for the company went higher year over year by 10%. Passenger revenue, these are the tickets that you're paying. And you know, we all know that we're paying an arm and a leg for these ticket prices. But even with that, the revenue year over year, it's not actually year over year, it's actually compared to 2019. Because last year we had the pandemic lockdowns, you cannot compare these results with last year. So they have to compare it with 2019. That's back when air travel was quote unquote normal. And when we do that, the passenger revenue is still lagging. It is down 4% from 2019 levels. But cargo revenue went higher by 46% from 2019 levels. So the majority of the increase in the revenue came from cargo. Keep that in mind. But look at expenses. Again, we're comparing to 2019 levels. Salaries are higher by 4%. Fuel costs are higher by 41%. Maintenance and repairs costs are up from 2019 levels by 20%. And aircraft rent, well, that costs 19% more than what it did back in 2019. All in all, the operating income for Delta Airlines is down 29% from 2019 levels. The company never recovered. And the profits, the net income, is down a stunning 49% from 2019 levels. So again, we have the same dynamic here. Revenues are up 10%. But why is net income down 49% from 2019? The answer is expenses are rising at a faster and a higher rate than the increase in the growth rate in revenues. And I'm asking you again, as the CEO of the company, Two different companies. We have airlines, we have Conegra, a consumer brand. What do you do? How do you remedy this situation? You might say, well, we have to increase prices even higher. But what if your consumers cannot afford your service? Are you a necessity? Are there any alternatives that they can use? Think of Starbucks, for example. They're increasing prices higher, but they're also receiving a backlash. The consumer has to cut spending on Starbucks because they're paying more at the pump, rents, utilities, grocery, etc. So what else? What else do you have as a CEO of one of these two companies, Conegra or Delta? The answer is you got another tool, which is reducing your expenses. Now, do you have any power in reducing the price inflation that you receive? Well, you don't. We got the PPI this morning and it went higher year over year and month over month. You got no control over that. You're going to pay that price. And then you hope that you can pass the extra cost to the end consumer. In this case, you can't. So what else can you do in reducing your expenses? Well, one thing you can do is reducing your administrative costs. And of course, as a CEO, you're not going to reduce your salary to improve the company's profits. What you're going to do is laying off employees, specifically employees that you deem unneeded for now. The demand is slowing down. When you look at the earnings reports for all of these companies, the volume of sales is actually down. The revenues only went higher due to the pricing power because they continue to increase prices. So the only viable solution that you got in your hands right now as a CEO of these companies, and we're seeing this theme, by the way, in company after company after company, each report is cementing this fact. Companies are raising prices, the revenues are, are going higher, but their profits are going down because inflation is rising at a higher and a faster rate 
in the rise in the revenues. So that leaves the only viable solution, which is getting rid of employees. And therefore, we're about to see the tsunami of layoffs. This is unsustainable. This is an alarming trend in corporate America's earnings, which will lead to layoffs. And we are already seeing the beginning signs of that. Today, we got the initial jobless claims for the week. And they went higher by 9,000 to 244,000. This is the highest level of claims since early November of 2021. So again, the bottom line is, for the Fed, in case they're listening, you're running out of time. The damage to the economy is happening little by little, but it is happening rapidly. If you don't kill the inflation monster right now by the shock and awe approach, you're going to have to do it when the economy is much weaker, when the economy has already lost lots of jobs, when the economy is seeing the pace of economic activity already moving to contraction territory. If you increase interest rates in that scenario, that recession will be longer and more painful. So the Federal Reserve must act now by being aggressive, by raising interest rates by 100 basis points minimum in the next meeting. These are all lousy choices we have, folks, but we're here. Thank you to the Fed. They got us here. They're both shitty options. Either to wait for the economy to die slowly and painfully, or to do it right now in a shock and all fashion, kill the economy, but kill inflation too, and then we start working on recovering this economy. And that will be a whole other conversation. Anyhow, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. And I start with the closing of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average went down by 142.62 points or a decline of 0.46%. The Nasdaq was actually positive to flattish, scoring gains wore 3.60 points or a gain of 0.03%. The S&P 500 was negative by 11.40 points or a decline of 0.30%. The sector performances were pathetic across the board with exception of technology, scoring the gold, silver and bronze medals because besides that pretty much everything is down. And the laggards are led by materials, energy and financials. So yesterday when we talked about is this the beginning of the revival, the inflationary trade of energy and materials? The answer is not really, at least for now. What about the advance to decline ratios, NYSE 21% advancing versus 75% declining? The Nasdaq 30% advancing versus 65% declining. What about commodities? It is the calm before the storm in crude oil futures, be it the WTI or Brent. What is the storm, you might ask? Well, it is the upcoming visit of President Biden to Saudi Arabia. It will probably be underway when you're watching this video, but the outcome is what's really important. My hunch is Joe Biden will not score a deal here, meaning the Saudis will say no to increasing production. But even if they say that, could we see a massive pump in oil? Maybe. Maybe we'll see some short covering. But there's another dynamic going on in China that is a headwind. We're seeing more lockdowns. The cases of the thing are rising again. That is another headwind pushing oil prices down. I doubt, given these circumstances, the Saudis will say, OK, Mr. Biden, you asked and we're going to increase the production of oil higher. I doubt that will happen because it will damage their economy. There are plenty of headwinds going on in the oil market right now. Among them, recession fears, the shutdowns in China, cases of the thing are rising again. It doesn't make sense to increase production right now, let alone maybe they're at a capacity to increase production in that country. In the meantime, gasoline futures, the RBOB, went down by about 1.5% today, while heating oil and natural gas futures were muted be it heating oil in the green, natural gas down in the red, losing about half a percentage point. Softs, what's going on here? Pain across the board, massive declines for cotton, coffee, lumber futures, all down big. But we also got declines of over 2% for cocoa futures. We're seeing more modest declines for both OJ and sugar futures, but OJ futures been getting hit hard as of late. Sugar has been rebounding, but it is pulling back along with the rest of softs. Metals, it was a bull trap yesterday. It looked good. Even I thought it was good. But the dollar popped higher again, perhaps based on news from Italy that PM Draghi is resigning. In any case, metals went down across the board. Big declines for gold, silver, platinum, copper, palladium. 
and I continue to watch copper. Copper is your leading indicator for the economic cycle. Copper is crashing big time. We've never seen such a crash since 2008, but we all know what happened after that. Meats, down across the board, be it modestly, at least when you compare it to metals. Live cattle, feeder cattle, lean hogs futures, all down by almost 1% apiece. Grains, we have a mixed picture here. While canola, oats, corn, and soybean meal futures went higher, rough rice was in the flat line, while we got declines for wheat, soybean oil, and soybeans. Wheat led the declines, losing about 2% today. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume is moving slightly higher for certain names, and we're seeing more buying of calls in certain names, indicating an attempt, at least, in dip buying. Apple was the hottest table by far at around 1.7 million contracts traded today. About 53% of those were calls. Tesla, number two, at around 1.1 million contracts traded for the name today. About 53% of those were calls. And at number three, Amazon. At around 800,000 contracts, about 56.5% of those were calls. Let's move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker QQQ. This is for the NASDAQ. What's going on here? Somebody's fading all these attempts of buying the dip and actually bidding for more declines to come at least in the long run. They bought the 254 puts for the expiration date September 16th with expectations that the Nasdaq could go down by more than 11.5% by then and they were willing to risk about 4 bucks and 70 cents a piece, all in all spending around 1.2 million dollars what about the ticker xlk this is the technology etf once again somebody is betting for more downside to come they bought the 120 puts for the expiration date august 19th with expectations that the xlk will go down by more than eight percent by then they paid around two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two million dollars and then we have the ticker six this is for six flags the name is down big since the highs somebody's betting for a rebound here they bought the 22 and a half calls for the expiration date august 19th maybe a summer ratty as we see the parks getting filled and the expectations are for six flag to rebound higher by more than eight percent by then they paid around one buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars what about the trade for the ticker clr this is for a name called continental resources an energy name somebody's bidding for more pain to come they bought the 55 puts for the expiration date september 16th with expectations that the name could move down by more than 13 percent by then they paid around two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two million dollars we will look at the chart of this name what do we see here it is a top performer this is a weekly chart for clr just like the rest of energy names they've been moving higher but as of late they went down big the name faced resistance at around 72 which is the previous high and it pulled down now we have a trend line very steep trend line there is a high likelihood of that trend line being broken why because we have a negative divergence in the RSI so watch out for this chart and then we have the ticker AVXL this is for a company called the Anavix researches or sciences whatever they made advances in Alzheimer research and therefore the name is moving higher as of late and somebody's betting for more gains to come perhaps a short squeeze they bought the 15 bucks calls for the expiration date August 19th with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 16 and a half percent by then they paid around one buck and 55 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around nine hundred thousand dollars and look at the chart for this name this is a weekly chart for avxl you have a sloping descending line of resistance that held over and over and over and over again and then we have what it appears to be a double bottom formation from that point on the stock bounced significantly higher and it crossed above the sloping line of resistance we're seeing a steepening in the RSI, in the MACD indicators, all of these are signs that the stock should be moving higher. And this is exactly what the trader is betting on. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, we have a spread, a put spread for COP ConocoPhillips. Somebody's bidding for more downside for the name. They bought the 75 puts. And they sold the 65 ones, all for the expiration date, September 16th. And the expectations here are for COP to move down by more than 8% by then, but not more than 20%. They paid around four bucks a piece for buying the 75 puts, and they received in credit about a buck and 60 cents a piece from selling the 65 puts. All in all, the entry cost is reduced to two bucks and 40 cents a piece and that brings the total all the way to 1.2 million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here i cautioned from betting on a rebound 
in materials and energy, the inflationary trade, and as you can see, they reversed the gains from yesterday right away. Financials are down too because of GPM's earnings in the morning. Likewise, the cyclicals are down big. The travel names reversing gains. What's holding right here? What's holding is Boeing. For now, we have a short squeeze in Boeing. We also have chips moving higher on news in the morning based on TSM Taiwan Semi. We also have consistent gains in Apple. Apple is one of the biggest winners for the week and it continues to outperform. Likewise, we also have an upgrade for Costco and that pushed Costco and Walmart higher. But besides that, I'm seeing weakness all in all. The theme, few exceptions here and there. They happen to be heavyweights today, such as Walmart, Costco, Apple, and chip stocks, and that pushed the Nasdaq in the green. Will that hold or not? Who knows? But for now, do we have any consistent theme looking at the map today? The answer is no. The answer, if any, is yes, we have a theme of weakness all in all. We can see that clearly in the heat map for the ETFs. Values down for the day. Growth outperform, be it flat, but we're seeing weakness across the board, specifically in international stocks. The EWZ for Brazil is down big. Canada, EWC is down big, almost 2% in the red today. We're seeing the XBI which tended to outperform in the last couple of days, moving down again. Financials down, energy down, materials down. We're only seeing chips moving higher based on Taiwan. That's not sustainable. And we're also seeing commodities, ETFs, moving down big. Gold, silver, GDX, SLV, GLD, all down big. And then we have oil ETFs, OIH, also down big, XOP, XLE. The only gainer in commodities is UNG for a mini rebound for now. But all in all, the theme is a lot weaker than the stock's heat map tend to show, or even by looking at the performance of indices. The Nasdaq was in the green today, but when you peel the picture, you look under the hood, this is not looking good at all. But perhaps the technicals and the charts can offer something different. Well, let's do that by starting with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? Yesterday, we talked about the bearish perspective of an ABC pattern, which should take us all the way down to 373.5, the next support and this is exactly what we got we got a gap down that got us below 373 and a half in the morning but we saw the dip bars showing up again and 373 and a half was retested as support and the chart closed at the highs of the day so what is the take here let's clean up the chart and here's the gap 378.87 we did not close above that but close enough now are these by the dip attempts based on the algos based on oversold conditions in the RSI from a 30 minutes perspective for example we saw them twice yesterday and today again or is this a sign of strength is this a sign that market participants are saying maybe we're seeing weakness in the morning because of european equities but then comes the dip bars not just once but twice this is a sign of strength at least according to the bulls now when was the last time when we saw a back-to-back -back attempt in buying the dip two days in a row and how did that end well maybe you can spot it if i clean up the chart and here it is we actually saw that last week two days in a row of buying the dip and what do you know the chart moved higher so what the bulls are saying right now is we're seeing buy the dip attempts this is a bullish sign not a bearish one the bears will counter and say last time around the rebounds happened from a double bottom from the same level this time around yes we're seeing dip buying again but it is happening from a lower low and that is a sign of weakness on top of that the chart did not close above the gap both sides have a persuasive argument but perhaps the daily chart can settle all of that here is the daily chart for the spy continuous contract the problem for the bulls is the following the volume is moving higher on down days on top of that the chart made a lower low and we're seeing weakness in the momentum indicators the rsi and the macd now does that mean it's over we're done here lower we go not so fast why because the spy is still holding at the support 3720 and a half the bears confirmation of the lower low that we got today is a violation of 3720 and a half because there are scenarios in which the chart could consolidate within this range for a few days maybe a few weeks and then move its way higher again but a violation of the support of 3720 and a half will most likely produce a confirmation in the macd indicator by crossing and producing red impressions on the histogram what about the cues 30 minutes chart what's going on here notice that the cues look a lot better than the spy we'll talk that about that in a minute but the cues another gap down rebounding from a double bottom same zone and closing at the highs of the day above the gap 
of 285.64 and above the support of 285. In other words, the Q's a lot stronger than the SPY. And that can be explained by the heat map that we just talked about a few minutes ago. We got an ad performance from Apple and an ad performance from Chips that explains the ad performance of the Q's. So the technicals say the Q's doing a lot better than the SPY. The Q's bullish, not bearish. But is the rebound that we got in Chips based on Taiwan's earnings sustainable or not? Are the gains so far in Apple sustainable or not? If the answer to those is yes, then the Q's will go higher. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Q's. Unlike the SPY, the Q's maintaining a pattern of higher lows, as you can see from the chart. It is keeping the support of 11,689. The momentum indicators remain positive for the Q's. The Q's doing a lot better than the SPY. And look at this. The contrast in performance year to date between the SPY and the Q's. SPY in blue, the Q's in orange, whatever that is. So far, the SPY, both of them are down, but the SPY at performing the Qs. But if we zoom in to the performance of July so far, the Qs pulled ahead. The Qs up about 3%, SPY barely up by 1% or so. Why is that? Well, the SPY lost the support and the cushion it had from energy and commodities. Materials all went down big time in July so far. They've been going down since June, and therefore the queues pulled ahead. When did we see that last time around in similar conditions, economically speaking? We have to go back to 2008. Here's the contrast in performance between the SPY in blue and the queues in orange once again. 2008 all the way to, let's say, June, July, the summer of 2008. Both of them were down, but the SPY outperformed the queues. Fast forward, since July 2008, all the way to the end of August of 2008. What happened in July 2008? We got the top in oil. The WTI made a top and it moved down from that point on. Well, guess what? In that period of time, the Qs outperformed the SPY. It went higher. It scored gains of almost 4% while the SPY remained negative. Are we seeing a similar scenario here? My bet is yes. What does that mean? If we have a rally, a summer rally, it will be led by the Qs not the SPY. What about a 30 minutes chart for the IWM Russell 2000 small caps? What's going on here? Yesterday, it appeared that the IWM was the best bet for the bulls because it outperformed both the SPY and the Qs. Today, we're getting a massive pie in the face because the Russell 2000 is the underperformer. It could not make it above the resistance of the gap at around 172.25, and it pulled down and lost the support, the very important support, 168.90, but it managed to close above Above that number by the end of the day. What does that mean? If we have a resumption, a buildup on the buying of the dip that we got today, we're going to face the gap. That would be the resistance number one. And then if that is passed, we have 172.25. But if the chart pulls down again, losing the support of 168.90, that would be a massive massive shorting signal. We'll talk about that over the weekend. In the meantime, what about the Dixie, the dollar index? What's going on here? Yesterday, the dollar faked some weakness, allowing the indices and the dip buyers to take charge. Today, we got similar action in the Dixie. It was much higher initially in the morning, perhaps based on news, on news that Italian Prime Minister Draghi is stepping down. We saw weakness in the euro and a surge in the dollar. But midday, the dollar started to move down pulling back. And hand in hand, the equities caught a bit. Now the dollar is getting severely overbought. It is reaching at least my resistance at around 109.5. The risk versus reward says the dollar should be pulling down soon. What does soon mean? I don't know, because it depends on a fundamental catalyst. It depends on a headwind for the dollar. Can we see any headwinds for the dollar coming? Maybe Fed members start to become more dovish and say, hey, 75 is a little too much in the next meeting. Let's do 50 basis points hike. That could be it, but I doubt it. Another one could be good news from Europe, pushing the euro higher, and that pushes the dollar index down. As a result, can we get any good news across the Atlantic? I doubt it. We're only getting bad news from uh, our European friends. Can the yen stage a massive rally higher? I don't see it for now. So what is the headwind for the dollar that will act as the key to unlock the overbought conditions in the momentum indicators to stage a pullback for the dollar? Let me know in the comments. But for now, moving on to gold, what's going on here? Since the dollar pushed higher today, gold moved down big time. So we got a bull trap, at least for now, in gold. But the good news for the gold bugs is the following. Number one, 
it is becoming extremely oversold, which means the risk versus reward says gold should be moving higher. But again, what is the headwind? What would be the catalyst for the dollar to move down? Because the dollar moving down is the tailwind that gold needs to move higher. Number two, we're getting closer and closer and closer to the next Fibonacci support at around once, uh, excuse me, 1,685. That should do it. That should produce a rebound unless we see another tailwind coming out of the blue pushing the dollar even higher then gold would violate the support the very important support critical support of 1685 for now the risk versus reward says gold should be moving higher dollar should move should be moving down we should see at least a relief rally in the equities market a summer rally and then the pain resumes this is looking eerily similar to 2008. What about crude oil? What's going on here? Four hours chart for Brent. We lost the double bottom potential at least in the morning today, but the traders changed their minds and said, you know what? Let's go back where we started. And that keeps the potential for a double bottom formation alive, at least for now. Why did the traders change their minds? Once again, it all revolves around Saudi Arabia and the visit by Biden. The traders are saying, wait a minute here, maybe what we've been doing so far by dumping crude, assuming that the Saudis will accommodate Biden, maybe that's not going to happen. We will see a short covering rally. We'll see what happens Friday. Tomorrow is a critical day for oil futures. But for now, the double bottom is still alive because the chart closed above 99 for the day. What about the 10-year yield? What's going on here? The weekly closing will be critically important. Why? If it is above 3%, it indicates more gains in the 10-year yield. But if it moves down and it closes the week below 3%, it indicates that we're going down to at least 2 0.75. Is the chart, technically speaking, conclusive one way or the other? The answer is not really. But there is another chart that is getting closer and closer to being conclusive, and that is the weekly chart for the TLT, the inverse, almost, for the 10-year yield. What are we seeing here in the TLT? Obviously, the momentum indicators got very, very oversold. We're waiting and waiting for a confirmation, a weekly closing in the MACD, showing us green impressions on the histogram. That would be a confirmation that the bearish momentum in the TLT is over, or we're about to have a new bullish momentum. That doesn't mean the TLT will blast higher and move all the way back to 160, 170. That's not what we're talking about. It could mean, number one, a stop in the declines for the TLT. That is about 20% of the cases when we see that kind of technical buildup. Or it could move slightly higher to let's say 125, even 128. And that forms the majority of the cases when we see that kind of technical setup. And then there is another case where we see oversold conditions in the RSI. And we see a move higher in both the RSI and the MACD indicator. Yet the chart continues to move down. That is a rarity. I would say it's about 10% of cases. And you can see that clearly in the chart of Netflix as of late. So for now, the assumption is the TLT at some point will have to pop higher. That means that the 10-year yield could go down. How would that play out in the equities market? We have to think about it. Is it going down yields, going down for the good reasons or the bad reasons? Going down for the good reasons would be less interest rate hike expectations. Going down for the bad reasons mean more recession expectations. What about the VIX four hours chart? What's going on here? The chart of the VIX supports SPY bulls for now. Why? It made another run today at 28.16 and it lost. It did not make it. Number two, the MACD indicator is showing a loss of positive momentum. The indicator is curling down, about to cross to produce red impressions on the histogram. So that supports SPY bulls, at least for now, as I see it for now. What about the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ? It is still holding above 32.72, but again, we're seeing weaker positive momentum in the VXN, which could be lost by tomorrow. We see decisive red impressions in the histogram of the VXN from a four hours perspective. That would be confirmed by losing the support of 32.72, and that would be good news for Nasdaq bulls. What about the daily chart for Apple? It is blasting higher, continues to be one of the strongest charts for the week. It retested the gap support, it bounced higher, it reclaimed 145 as support. So far, so good. But we have a stiffer resistance at around 150. Now, last Sunday, I talked about eyeing 150 as resistance for Apple to initiate a put options trade. I have to see how the chart acts 
at around 150. If the chart struggles to pass 150 and then it pulls down and it loses 145 for support, then I got my short trade. I got a confirmation for a put options trade all the way to at least 138.79. But right now, as I see it right now, I see a lot of strength for Apple. It could have pulled back before 150, but it continues to go higher. We continue to see more buying of call options in Apple for whatever reason. Doesn't matter what the reason is. All of these are signs for strength. They indicate that Apple could pass 150 as resistance and turn that into support. So be careful if you're going to just short because Apple at 150. This is not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm waiting for a rejection, a loss of 145 as a confirmation. If that doesn't happen, then higher it goes. Tesla, 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? The chart lost 700 of support repeatedly, but the dip buyers continue to show up, pushing the chart to reclaim 700 of support two days in a row. This is a sign for strength, not weakness. Furthermore, we have a sloping line of resistance right now, and the chart passed that line by the closing of today. Tesla bulls would argue that what we got so far is a formation of a reverse head and shoulder. You combine that with the passing above the sloping line of resistance and you got two arguments here that says Tesla will go higher. For now, who has the better argument, Tesla bulls or Tesla bears? From a 30 minutes perspective at least, the answer is Tesla bulls. The bears will gain momentum again if the chart closes below 700 for the week. But for now, the bulls are in charge. And lastly, Bitcoin, an hourly chart, what's going on here? We talked about the important support of 19,550 or 20,000, doesn't matter. The chart is above both, but we talked about another important resistance. Now, well, it's kind of resistance and support for now, at least at the at time of the recording of this video, which is 20,450. The chart for now is forming a bull flag pattern, indicating that it should be moving higher. So let's recap. Bitcoin is showing positive formation. So is Tesla. So is Apple. So is the VIX showing a positive formation for the bulls, market bulls. What we're waiting for is the Dixie to pull down. What we're waiting for is the 10-year yield to calm down. I'm not sure if moving higher or lower in a significant way is good for the market, but just a cooling down will be good enough. We're waiting for the charts of the SPY and the Qs from a daily chart perspective, at least in the continuous contract, to maintain the important support levels. To recap it all, the bulls have an advantage over the bears, at least for now. Things could change by tomorrow, the weekly closing, we have options expiration, but for now, at the time of the recording of this video, the bulls have a slight advantage. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the most important retail sales. We also have the import price index. We have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. We have the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And we have business inventories. We also have another important uh, hawk for now, at least, the zombie from Atlanta, Raphael Boystick. So we have Bullard backing off. We have Waller who backed off today, will boy stick back off tomorrow. And if he does, that would be a big catalyst for the market to rally. So watch out for that. But for now, folks, this is all I got for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again over the weekend. Take care.